Hi everyone. So I'm here to talk to you today about problematic video gaming and addiction, or why it's not a good idea to play EverQuest for 16 hours a day. Now, I know to most of you in the audience that'll probably seem fairly obvious, but well, all I can say was that as a teenager it seemed like a good idea at the time. So Andrew's already introduced me, I, I won't spend too much time on this, I'm a psychotherapist practicing in, practicing in Christchurch, New Zealand, and I spend a lot of time working with different addictions, including at a couple of residential treatment centres uh, around New Zealand. Before all of that though, I was Benway Monochrome, a level 60 bard, then Potamus, a level 60 hunter, Plonk, a level 85 druid, Kerr, a level 60 druid, and at least 20 other characters in various games. And I've spent countless hours in you know, other things, Left 4 Dead, Team Fortress, League of Legends, and so on. One of the cool things about some of these modern video games is you can type in a command, it'll show you exactly how long you've played that game for. Uh, somebody online referred to it as a mortality reminder. So from that perspective, I was able to type in this command and see that at one point I'd spent 2,000 hours of my life, or thereabouts, on playing just one of these characters and, and many, many more hours on various other characters. I went through a period of about two or three years where I was playing for about 16 hours a day, literally every single waking moment from when I got up to when I went to bed. So that's part of my reason for an interest in this topic is that you know, this is something I've sort of experienced myself as well as having worked with it clinically. I thought I'd just, this is a bit of a sort of throwback to what I spent 16 hours a day staring at. I know game graphics have come on a long way since then, but just thought I'd show you that so you have a bit of an idea about what my life looked like for that few years. And the end result of that was all fairly predictable. I ended up $20,000 or more in debt since I failed out of university, had a whole lot of student loans. I had no job, no qualification, no girlfriend. Turns out, turns out most women are not that impressed by how many internet dragons you've slain. I know, that surprised me too. <laughs> I, I was badly depressed, see the point above. But on the other hand, I was on the top 5% of my server in arenas, this is in World of Warcraft, and I had a seriously badass epic weapon. I've included a picture of that there so you can appreciate, <laughs> so you can appreciate why I sacrificed all those other things. So, what are we gonna talk about today? Well, first of all, I wanted to spend a bit of time uh, answering some of the questions that I frequently get asked about this topic. Uh, we unfortunately don't have time for a Q&A today, but I'll be around during lunch if you do have any other questions you'd like to ask me. I, I want to spend a bit of time looking at the psychological factors behind gaming. What is it that draws people to games, and how does that lead to addiction? Talk a little bit about this idea of gaming as a continuum, from sort of casual gaming all the way through to addictive gaming. And then importantly, obviously, spend some time talking about, you know, how can we actually help young people who might be experiencing problems around their gaming? So these are some of the questions that I, I commonly get asked. You know, how much is too much? When does it actually become an addiction? When does it become a problem? And as I hope to show today, it's not so much about how much somebody is gaming, but it's more to do with how and why. What purpose does the game serve? What function is it filling? How does it fit within the rest of their life? What problems is it causing? Because when we can look at it from that perspective about how it kind of fits within the overall context of their life, then I think we can start to understand where it starts to shift into being a problem. And I'll, I'll come on back to that. I've got a bit more to say about it. Do violent video games make kids more aggressive? There's been a ton of research done in this space and some of it seems quite conflicting. Uh, the American Psychological Association organized a task force which released a report last year looking at all the research around this topic and it suggested that yes, you know, video games can lead to aggressive behaviors and cognitions. And then 200 or more various scholars from other universities wrote a rebuttal to this, wrote a response to this report saying that, that they thought the science behind it was flawed. But there has been a lot of research and it seems like you know, it is a risk factor comparable to that of other violent media. However, I mean, it's, it seems obvious, I think, these days that, you know, games are not going to go away. Regulation hasn't been effective. Violence has always sort of tended to be a part of them. So I think it's important that we think about how can we mitigate this risk factor? And I think, thankfully, many of the ways that we can mitigate this risk factor are similar to how we would mitigate the risk factor for addiction and problematic overuse, which I'll come back to as well. How can I help somebody who I think might be addicted? Well, as I hope to show today, I think that has to start with really understanding why they game, what is it that they're getting out of it, what needs are they meeting, and helping them to find other ways to meet those needs. 
And lastly, if my kid is developing a gaming addiction, are they doomed? Is it only going to get worse? And I think this comes from a very sort of common idea around addictions, that they're kind of a, pro a progressive illness, that once you've got an addiction, it's just sort of a downward spiral until you die or something. But actually, the research doesn't support this. One of the largest ever studies done into alcoholism in the United States, it looked at about 4,500 Americans who at some point in their lives had met criteria for alcohol dependence, which is kind of a clinical way of saying that they were alcoholics. And when they did this study, they found that of those 4,500 Americans at the time of the study, only about a quarter still met criteria for alcohol dependence. Some of the others were still drinking in risky ways, some of the others were still drinking, but you know, in, in quite moderate, moderated ways, and some were not drinking at all. And of those 75% who no longer met criteria for dependence, only about a quarter had ever received any kind of treatment for it. And there's been other research done around this for other things, like gambling, and it seems to suggest a very similar kind of numbers, that actually the natural course of addiction for many people is recovery. Of course, there's a number of people who do need some treatment, who, who don't recover without some kind of intervention and support. And there's a lot of people for whom their recovery might be greatly sped up if they had the right kind of support, which is why I think it's helpful to think about how we can provide that. So just some uh, statistics around problem gaming, so you have a bit of an idea of the size of the problem. Uh, but first of all, just, just to get a sense from this audience, how many people here would play a game of some kind on a phone, tablet, PC, console, whatever, at least once a week? Yeah, good number of people here, that's, that's about average. How many people would play a game of some kind at least once a day? Good number of people still. How many people are planning on using the breaks in this conference to go looking for Pokemon in the venue halls? <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, given how much space there is, I'm going to be pretty annoyed if you're blocking the food table. <laughs> so uh, this, is the, this is the thing, you know, gaming's hugely popular these days. It, it's kind of everywhere and it's not going to go away. And there has, it's, it's difficult to research exactly, you know, how many people are uh, affected by this issue because there's no established criteria. There's not yet uh, a classification of internet gaming disorder that's been accepted universally. However, there have been studies conducted around the world, including here in Australia, using different criteria. And the, a lot of these studies seem to come up with a similar kind of number, that somewhere around about 10% of young people aged 13 to 25 are gaming in a way that could be a problem or could be seen as addictive. So, and I'm sure this kind of, you know, probably reflects many of your experiences, that there are a substantial number of young people affected by this issue. So why do people game? There's been a lot of research done into the reasons people game, and specifically the reasons that people game that lead to problems, that lead to addiction. And those reasons seem to be a little bit different from the people who are just gaming for fun, to have a bit of a blast, you know, online or whatever. So one of the reasons that's been identified that can lead to addiction is that games provide people, with, players, with a sense of purpose and goals. They give them a sense of having a meaningful impact on the game world, of uh, working towards an objective and clearly laying out the steps that they need to take to get there. And this can be a pretty big reason for some people. You think about, especially as like a teenager, it's a difficult time of life. There's a lot of very complex decisions to be made, trying to work out, you know, how do I balance being accepted with my peer group with the fact that I've still got to be kind of reliant on my parent, doing well at school? How do I decide, you know, what am I going to do with my future, with my career? How do I make sense of my sexuality? All these kind of complicated questions that don't have easy answers. And I remember how this was for me at this point, trying to make sense of, you know, what am I going to do with my life? And my dad's telling me I should be an engineer, and my careers advisor at school's telling me I should be a computer scientist, and my teenage brain's telling me I should be Han Solo. And, and it turns out the local university only offers training in two of those three things. <laughs> so you were trying to make these kind of difficult decisions, and you compare that to the game, where it says, you know, this is what you've got to do, this is how you've got to get there. It's very sort of straightforward. Along similar lines, games provide players a sense of kind of achievement and potency of being good at something. Games provide challenges to players, but they're challenges that are designed to be beaten and they give immediate and often quite sort of substantial rewards to players when they overcome those challenges. So there's this constant and immediate sense of getting better, of being accomplished at something. And again, kind of compare this to the real world where I don't know, maybe you know, I did all right on that maths test, I got a B plus or something, that feels kind of good. But it's not a very kind of compelling, oh, I don't think I'm losing my mic here, but hang on. It doesn't comp compel in quite the same way. 
or you know, maybe my rugby team won on the weekend. I mean, I realize that probably doesn't happen as often here, but I'm coming from New Zealand, so. Hang on, I'm going to see if I can fix this mic a bit, otherwise we're going to lose sound. Uh, yeah, and you compare this to the game where it's like, you know, I got together with 40 of my friends and uh, defeated the Lich King and saved the world. You know, there's this huge sense of being a part of something big that's very hard to kind of replicate for many people in the real world. Games these days, especially since most of them are online, also provide a real sense of community and belonging. Uh, a lot of the games require players to work together either to o beat other teams or to overcome the challenges within the game itself. And so players form these kind of long-standing organizations or guilds or teams within the games, and there's a real sense of kind of, you know, community and connection that comes from that. And again, you think about this from the point of view of a teenager like myself. You know, I wasn't very popular in school. I was bullied a lot. I didn't really feel like I fit in too well. And I can log into the game and there's like, you know, 40, 50 people welcoming me online, asking me for help, being glad to see me. You can see how this can be like a really powerful draw for some kids. And this can end up being a sort of a bit of a double-edged sword as well. Because the way these games work, uh, that require players to work together, increasingly there can be a sense for many players that you're kind of letting people down if you're not in the game. You're letting your friends down. And you see this sometimes with young people, if you try and interrupt them in the middle of something, you get quite a, quite a hostile reaction. And it, you know, various reasons for that, but it may be that you know, from a parent's point of view, it's just they're just turning off the game, they can come back to it at any point. But for the young person, they're abandoning all their friends in the middle of something, they're kind of leaving them to it. And another part of this is the sense of needing to keep up. A lot of these games, if you're not playing the game, it's very easy to kind of fall behind. And so a lot of people I've sort of spoken to, they get the sense, you know, they've got to keep playing just in order to stay, stay relevant, to stay up to date. And this is uh, becoming increasingly an issue with some of the free-to-play games that we're seeing, where games ca uh, gamers can pay real money in order to progress in the game. And I had a couple of young people I worked with who ended up, you know, racking up quite substantial debts because they're paying money in order to get ahead in the games, just to keep up with their friends. Another thing that games provide is a sense of freedom and escape. Uh, modern games are incredibly immersive. It's very easy to lose yourself in the world of the game. So for somebody who might have a lot of stress going on in their life for whatever reason, or they've got anxiety or depression or things are difficult at home, games can provide an amazing way to kind of block all that out for a while, to just get away from it. And this can be another reason that people get sucked into the games, find it hard to step away from them. And lastly, games can also provide players with a, a sense of a different identity. Sometimes in quite a literal way, like some of the games I played, where you actually take on the role of a character in that game, and while you're playing, as far as everyone else is concerned, you, you kind of are that character. But in other ways, this happens as well. So sometimes people just find that they're able to act differently and relate to other people differently from the way they do in real life. Maybe they find it hard to find the right words, they find it hard to be confident in real life, but they go in the games and they find that suddenly they find that you know, it's easy to express themselves. So they have a very different sense of who they are in the game from the person they experience themselves to be in the real world. And that can be a big part of the reason why some people find it difficult to get away from the games as well. Just want to show you a, a quick video. This is taken from a documentary about gaming addiction showing various gamers talking their own words about the reasons that they play games. And I think you'll see that many of these same kind of themes come through. Huge waste of time. What does it do for you? I just get to be pretend someone for a little bit, you know? Just like, you know, if I wanted to be a movie star per se, I get to kind of be a movie star in, in this world. He uses it as a coping skill. Since he bought World of Warcraft, I can think of one day, one day, that I think he hasn't played it. When do you know when to call it quits for a day? Yeah, that's, that's probably the hardest thing about the game. I don't know when to call it. 40 is less than Yeah. Would you say comparatively with you versus other players, do you take this game more serious than other players? No, I don't think so. I think I just know how things work and I just, not more than anyone else, I'm just saying, like, I know what I'm doing out there and I know what the people I need to be grooved with to get things done. And fortunately, this is a fun way of getting things done, so. Not so it's easy in real life sometimes, but there's less hassle, the, the objective's right in front of you, really. You have more control over it, I think. Interact with all my friends. It's a way to release your inhibitions. You can act however you want, they don't know the real you. 
So you don't even have to be who you are. Come on. You can create a persona. You can come home, turn off reality, and live in a fantasy world. I'm a lazy daydreamer guy. I like experiencing things that I can't experience in this world. And being in games like Warcraft and other MMOs I've played gives you a whole chance of a whole different world. When I've had a rough day at work and I don't feel like dealing with people, I can go off and fly around the Outland for two hours just farming. That, to me, is a real freedom. To escape into a game? People that don't have money in real life can go in the game and be wealthy and buy items and have things and experience those same psychological rewards of having money and assets and items and things. And when you're in a situation where your needs and desires are fulfilled day after day after day in a very easy way because attaining these things within the game is super easy compared to how it is in real life. It, it's no wonder why people just, just get sucked into these and play them day after day after day. What the best thing about online games is the people. The community aspect of it just drew me in. It's a sense of community. It's just like a community. It's a community. It's just like a basketball team or a soccer team. You hang out together, you practice together. Playing online games lets me meet people from all over the world. From Texas, Atlanta, California, Nevada, Germany, Japan, France, Australia, Canada. You don't even have to step outside your door or meet other people in person. You can get online and talk to people that you'd never ever meet in their normal course of your life. It's not just about the game when it comes to a massive online community of people. You're not logging on to play the game after three months. You're logging on to play with your friends playing a game. So you see in these people kind of talking about their own experiences, many of these themes coming through, people using it to escape, to create a different sense of identity of themselves, for the community, for the sense of control and achievement, all these kind of different things. And I really recommend looking up this documentary. It's free to watch online. Some yeah, really, really useful stuff and interesting anyway, just seeing you know, people talking about their experiences with gaming addiction. So, how does it actually become a problem? How do we get from casual gaming through to, through to an addiction? Because obviously a lot of people play games and for many of them it's not a problem. So we've got this idea of a sort of a continuum that at one end you've got people you know, playing in this very casual way all the way through to addiction. And somewhere in between is you know, people who, who play a lot as a hobby but don't really experience any problems from it. So as I've illustrated, you know, gaming meets a lot of different psychological needs, this need for belonging, for escape, for identity, and it meets them in a very easy and very consistent way. And this is a, a common feature with many addictions, is that it provides a very consistent, very reliable experience that's easy to attain. So other activities that meet psychological needs, you know, other hobbies, other interests, very often it's not as easy to engage with them and it's not as consistent in what you get out of them. So this is one of the things that makes gaming very compelling. And when games become the only way in which a person meets a particular psychological need, that's when other areas of that person's life might start to suffer. So when that starts to happen, somebody who's developing a problem with gaming might start to think obsessively about the game even when they're not playing. With young people, you'll see often you know, they, they're talking about it, they're watching videos, they're watching other players play, they're reading about it. I, I got to the point, and I think other people I, I, I hear about have done this too, was I was dreaming about the game. And I have to admit to a certain degree of envy for players today because at least their dreams will be in a lot higher resolution than mine were. <laughs> People start to lose track of time while gaming to the detriment of other areas of their life. They start to neglect social activities. They start to stay up later than they intended to, not get their homework done, you know, miss appointments, all this kind of thing. And they might start to become agitated or depressed when their gaming is interrupted. I'm sure many parents are familiar with that experience. And they start to perhaps develop a tolerance needing to play for longer in order to get the same sense of satisfaction. And importantly, they start to use gaming as a coping strategy. And this is where you start to get the sort of the self-reinforcing cycle going on. Because as the gaming starts to cause problems in their life, that creates you know, painful feelings. So maybe they don't do as well at school. Uh, they're getting, their teachers are getting upset with them, they're getting uh, you know, rejected by their parents or their peers, they're getting frustrated, and they start to use the game as a way to deal with the feelings that these problems are creating for them. That's how it starts to become an addiction, and at this point people might actually start to experience withdrawal symptoms when not playing, including depression, anxiety, or difficulty concentrating, and they continue to game even though they may no longer actually enjoy it. And I remember reaching a point like this myself, where I, I sort of suddenly struck me that, you know, in order to make any progress in the game, I was having to do the same repetitive tasks over and over and over. And I realized, this is basically just like a job, except I'm not getting paid for it. 
Al although, in hindsight, it kind of worked out because I, I sold my character on eBay for about $300, which I worked out, I did the calculations. I was getting paid about 15 cents an hour. So maybe not a very, uh, very sound financial decision. And at this point, people might start to neglect other areas of their life to a critical degree. And you see sort of examples of this in the news, the really extreme situations. A young guy in Korea spends 72 hours on a gaming binge and dies of a heart attack, or a couple in China who neglect their child to the point that the child dies of malnutrition because they're so caught up in the games that they're playing. So these are, I mean, the real extremes. But, but along the way, you see a lot of people who lose relationships, who fail out of school or university, who lose their jobs over it. So it can have some quite serious impacts for some people. So how do you tell the difference? Well, as I hope I'm showing, it's not so much about how much, but how and why somebody is gaming. And specifically, when gaming becomes the only way for a person to meet a particular psychological need, that's when there's, you know, the potential for problems. And of course, this can become self-reinforcing. The more gaming is used to meet a particular psychological need or experience a certain feeling, the harder it becomes to meet that need in other ways. So the more time I was spending online with my guild, you know, um, building friendships in the game, working together with my friends there, the less time I was spending with friends in the real world. And so I started to become more and more socially anxious. I started to feel less and less confident because I wasn't actually developing the social skills in the real world. Or well, similarly, the more time I spend kind of perfecting my skills in the game, playing arenas and stuff like that, the less time I'm spending getting good at other things. So if I step away from the games, there's a sense that I've got you know, a lot less to go on with. There's a lot less kind of confidence in my abilities. So it starts to become this kind of self-reinforcing cycle. So how can we help young people with this issue? Well, I think it's important to recognize this first of all. Like with any addiction, uh, a person has to come to the point of realizing it as a problem for themselves, which is a really frustrating position to be in as a parent or as a clinician, somebody who wants to help. But ultimately, we, we are quite limited in what we can do. However, we can help them start to come to this realization for themselves by helping to sort of prompt the right questions, and we can prepare them, we can give them the uh, opportunity so that when they do recognize it, they know what to do about it, they've got some way to kind of step away from the games. So it's crucial that they know that the support is available and alternatives are available when they're ready to make that decision, when they're ready to seek those things out. So I think some of the key ways that we can help are around helping them to explore and understand the gaming and its function in their lives so that they can reach this point of sort of realizing that you know, maybe it's not actually giving them everything that they want. We can help by reducing and eliminating perpetuating factors. We can help through our own modeling and we can help by supporting alternatives. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about some of those. So I think, yeah, a key part of this is helping to try and understand what function is the game serving the person's life, what needs is it meeting, and getting them to start thinking about these things for themselves. So there's a few kind of questions that I might ask or encourage people to think about for themselves around each of these kind of needs that gaming can meet. So around this issue of purpose and goals, you know, do you have things that you're working towards outside of gaming? Or do you ever feel like games give you a sense of accomplishment or progress that you're not getting anywhere else? Or do you ever feel like life would be boring or meaningless without games? There was a study done with some South Korean young people who were experiencing gaming addiction. And one of the things that came out of that was a lot of them were saying, you know, without games, life would be bleak, it would be dark. There was a sense that games were giving them, you know, their kind of sense of purpose. It's really important to understand, is, is this one of the needs that gaming is meeting for this person? I've just included a few quotes at the bottom of these slides from some of the people I spoke with for my master's research. Again, because I think it's you know, really helpful to hear these different voices, different people talking about their experiences with gaming addiction and kind of re reflecting these same themes. Around this e issue of achievement and potency, do you ever feel like gaming is the only thing that you're good at? Because I worked with a young guy for a while and he said, you know, if I give up games, then, then I'm nothing. I don't have anything else that I feel good at. That was it for him. So part of the work involved finding other ways that he could get that experience. Do you feel like it's too hard to get good at other hobbies or interests? Or do you feel like you get more recognition in the game than anything you do in real life? Because if so, that's gonna be a really kind of powerful factor wanting them to you know, make them wanna keep playing. Around this issue of community and belonging, are more of your friends online only than people you know in real life? Or do you feel more respected or needed in game than you do in real life? Is that where you're getting your sense of kind of being valued? 
Or do most of your conversations with real life friends revolve around gaming? And I think this one's, it can't overemphasize enough this community aspect, because this is one of the things obviously that everybody, but young people in particular, are looking for, is a sense of belonging, a sense of being part of something, and games can very easily provide that. Around this issue of freedom and escape, do you sometimes play games to get away from difficult feelings or stresses in your life? Or like it's hard to relax or have fun without games? Or do you sometimes feel better just thinking about gaming or planning to game? And one of the young pe uh, people I spoke to for, for my master's research, he said, you know, the earliest photos I have of myself, about age four, age five, he, he said, I'm sitting holding a gaming controller. And he knew why, too, because his parents would often fight. There was, there was quite a lot of uh, emotional abuse and alcoholism with his parents. And as soon as their voices would start to raise, he'd go into the next room and fire up the console because he could, you know, focus on that. It would take his mind off what was happening in the next room. And this is a bit different from some addictions, a lot of other addictions which don't develop you know, until later in life. But kids as young as four and five can start using games and technology as a way to kind of cope, as a way to switch off from things that are happening outside. So this is where, as I've come back to, you know, being aware of the perpetuating factors and trying to minimize those can be an important part of helping as well. Around this question of identity, do you feel like people know you better in game than they do in real life? Or do you like the way you are in game more than the person you are in real life? Because if you do, it's gonna be really hard again to kind of step away from that. Or what are you doing with your life? Do you really wanna throw away everything your mother and I worked? Oh, uh, don't ask that one. No, don't. That's, that's one that my parents suggested. I meant to take it out, sorry about that. Um, so one of the people you know, in my research said, you know, people around the world would message me and say, you're my idol. Imagine how compelling that can be. And I've included this quote as well, the same guy, because it really resonated with me. There's such a large disconnect, he said, between who you are online and who you are in real life. The more you're kind of becoming popular and powerful and you're liking who you are in the game, the more your real life is suffering, it's diminishing. So when you step out of the game, you're suddenly hit by this overwhelming sense of despair and depression, which of course for many people serves to just push them back into the game. So this is really important to be aware of this, is that for someone stepping away from the game, there's a lot that they're giving up, so helping them to kind of find the alternatives is really important. We can also help by reducing or eliminating perpetuating factors. So some of the kind of perpetuating factors that we need to be aware of are lacking the means or support or the encouragement to engage in meaningful activities. It might be that they lack the financial support or it might be that no one's ever kind of sat down with them and taken the time to work out, you know, what matters to them, what, what do they find value in and help them, you know, engage with that. Situations in life that lead them to feeling impotent or out of control or powerless, particularly things like bullying or domestic violence, challenges in the home, feeling out of control and powerless is, is a very big reason why people turn to addictions and particularly to gaming, where there's a sense of having, you know, having control, having this potency that you don't have elsewhere. Lack of strong peer relationships outside of the game. If they don't have that, then it's very easy to get those needs met in the game or any other kind of stresses or, or difficulties in their life that might be uh, contributing to them needing to use games as an escape. So uh, mental health issues can be a big part of this as well. A third way we can help, and this is more relevant for parents, but, but you know, also relevant for clinicians and so on, is, is modeling. What are is, what is the behaviors we're modeling ourselves? And obviously this starts with modeling appropriate use of technology ourselves. If the kid goes to the parents and you know, asks for help with something and gets told, you know, hang on, I've just got to finish this email, then they're gonna find it hard to understand when the parent wants them to just kind of drop everything in the middle of a game. So we need to be mindful about what we're doing ourselves. But equally, the modeling around each of these other needs is an important part of the picture. Kids need to see that their parents or other adults in their lives are able to find or meet these needs in other ways. So finding ways to experience meaning and purpose in their life. Modeling ways to experience, you know, having a sense of competency, of accomplishment in other areas. Modeling ways to connect with others and have good social relationships. A close friend of mine said, you know, when he was growing up, his, his parents weren't, weren't very social people. They didn't have any friends around to the house. They didn't seem to have many social connections. And when they did talk about other people, it was almost always kind of complaining or talking about how difficult it was or how stressful it was. So he grew up with this idea that, you know, connecting with others, making social connections was gonna be difficult, it was gonna be painful, it was gonna be hard work. 
So when he found games and found a community that was kind of instantly accepting and welcoming, it was very, very easy for him to slip into that. So it's important that we think about how we model these other needs as well. Similarly, modeling other ways to manage difficult feelings and stress, showing that there are other ways to deal with the painful feelings that come up in life, with anger, disappointment, rejection, hurt, that we can manage these without distracting ourselves. If parents have a hard day at work, they're stressed out and they come home and they distract themselves with a glass of wine or watching TV or a book, it's sending that message that you know, one way to get rid of these feelings or deal with them is distraction. So we need to show other ways through talking about them, through finding outlets for them and so on. And lastly, and importantly, is finding ways to support alternative ways to meet these needs. So helping them to engage with activities that give them a sense of meaning. And one of the young guys I worked with, he, he'd always been passionate about the environment, but he'd never really known how, no one ever sort of supported him to find a way to kind of act on that meaning. And so part of our work involved helping him kind of connect with some volunteer organizations where he could not only get the sense of community and belonging that he'd previously got from the game, but also get the sense of purpose and meaning of doing something that mattered to him. Supporting them to have the patience and to develop competencies in other areas, to get, be able to get the sense of accomplishment and potency outside of the game. Helping them to build and repair existing relationships so that they can experience this sense of belonging. And there's many different ways that this can happen. You know, it can be a sense of belonging or connection with friends, within the family, within hobby groups, church groups, whatever it is, helping them find somewhere where they experience the sense of connection and encouraging them to explore and develop a sense of identity for themselves, helping them to have a space where they can start to make sense of some of these questions. And I think it's important as well to kind of recognize that, uh, you know, th these alternatives, we can make them available, but it's not necessarily going to be the case that they jump straight to them. In fact, more than likely they're not. I know my mum said, you know, she was quite disappointed. One of the things she'd always tried to do for us as kids was make sure that we had, you know, had the chance to try out lots of different activities so that we could find out for ourselves what we liked. And I did. I played almost every single sport. I'd, uh, you know, try all kinds of crafts. By the time of 15, I'd learnt to both cross-stitch and knit. <laughs> But she, she was disappointed because she said, you know, as soon as the gaming came along, you didn't care about any of that, you just dropped it all. So I felt like I failed. And I was a bit surprised because, I, I mean, it made sense to me, but I hadn't seen it that way because when I reached the point where I was ready to give up gaming or I, I started to see that, you know, it, it wasn't actually fun for me anymore, I knew that there were these things I could go back to that I'd once enjoyed, that had once given me a sense of satisfaction. So I think it's really important to you know, hold this in mind that the, the alternatives that we provide and the modeling we provide, even if it doesn't appear to have an immediate impact, it may do at some point further down the line when they're ready to make that change for themselves. My dad expressed kind of a, a similar thing, you know, because the stuff that, you know, it, it takes time to re-engage with the real world. I'd always loved uh, tramping when I was a kid, so my dad was always, you know, when I, was, when I was on the computer, he was always trying to encourage me to go out for a hike with him, get out into the bush. And eventually I relented and I said, all right, you know, let, let's go for a trip to the West Coast. And I remember my sort of initial reaction, having spent all this time in the game, which was, what is this? This is rubbish. It's like someone's taken the same tree graphic and just copy and pasted it a thousand times. So I, I think having patience ourselves and having this kind of curiosity and desire to understand are really important if we're to help young people with this issue. So again, as I said before, providing alternative ways to manage difficult feelings and experiences, being open to having these conversations with them, to listening about what's going on for them, and if necessary, you know, finding them other support, finding professionals to help them deal if there are particularly difficult feelings that they're trying to escape from into the games. So to conclude, I, th I hope I've shown problematic and addictive gaming primarily arise where gaming is meeting psychological needs that are not being met elsewhere in the person's life. And so understanding the function of the games, understanding what needs are being met, is crucial if we're to help somebody with this problem. Because the, the needs of a person who is gaming in order to experience a sense of community and belonging and connection are quite different from somebody who's gaming in order to get the sense of potency or achievement or pride. And when we can understand that, then we'll be in a better position to know what kind of alternatives to support. And as I said, these are some of the key needs that games can meet. And so to help somebody with an addiction means finding alternatives, finding ways to support them to meet these needs in other areas, as much as it means controlling the gaming itself. 
And there's a few online resources. I strongly recommend you know, checking some of these out. I mean, there's my own website there that's got a lot more information. But uh, there's a couple of online communities as well uh, where people talk about their own experiences with this issue, both as gamers and as parents and friends and uh, partners or whatever of gamers. Really worth going on there and actually kind of reading about you know, how are other people experiencing this issue and what's worked for them in overcoming it. And I've also you know, put my contact details there. And I really encourage you to get in touch if you have any kind of comments or questions. Because one of the things that tends to happen with uh, discussion around, I think any new issue, and gaming is no exception, is there tends to be quite polarized debate around it at times. On the one hand, you've got people saying, you know, gaming's terrible, it's responsible for school shootings, it's causing a crisis in masculinity. And on the other end of things, you've got people saying, oh, it's just a harmless hobby, it's no different from anything else, nothing to worry about. And I think there's a lack of this sort of more nuanced conversation, a more nuanced discussion around how is gaming evolving? What's changing? What needs are being met? What are we seeing? And, and you know, obviously there are changes all the time. Our understanding is always going to be lagging behind the changes. So I think it's really important that we keep having these conversations so that we can continue to stay abreast of what's developing and so we continue to grow our understanding. Because I think when we really get to the heart of what needs gamers are meeting for people, what needs are being fulfilled, then we'll be in a position to help them step away from the games and back into the real world. Thank you.